once you've got a little bit of headspace around it, you'll realize that you have a bunch of these skills and the ramp is not as big as you think it is. I'd like to welcome Elise Keith to the Productivity Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, happy to be here. So I look at the title of your book, Where the Action Is, The Meetings That Make or Break Your Organization. And the first thing I think about when I look at the just the front cover of your book is meetings and action. Sometimes that they can prevent action. Meetings can. They, they you know, when people get pulled into meetings, they's like, I was doing some stuff and now I have to go to this meeting. And there's this, this um, repulsion and that might be a strong word, maybe not. <laughs> that, is a, that is an extremely <laughs> strong word, but don't bring it. Bring it. <laughs> there is this like the, this this hesitancy <laughs> to uh, to accept the meeting. What first? Let, let's let's ta- let's kind of dig into the, the 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 title a bit because I think that uh, that's th- some people would have strong feelings, maybe not repulsion feelings, but like okay, meetings action. There, I know I get action items out of it, but it's pulling me away. What what do you have to say to those people that are, are you know, um, hesitant or, uh, you know, compelled to kind of be very averse to going into meetings, especially as they start to explore the nature of your book? So uh, we actually, tech, I actually tackle that in the very first, right up front, in the first section of the book, which is about escaping the bad meetings doom loop. Right. And and it's that kind of um, innate reaction we have to the word meetings that we have to stop and take a look at and go, OK, wait a second. Why is this happening? Mm. Um, and and what what's what kind of because I have this belief that, oh, meetings are going to be a waste of time or whatever it is. What is that causing me to do? What are my actions that come out of that belief? And based on those actions, what's that inspiring in the people around me? And um, when you look at that part of the question and that reaction, right? Oh, meetings are going to be a problem. And you have this moment once a week, once a day, you know, once every two weeks, whatever it is, where you're going to get into a room with the other people you're trusting to make your business, your team, your work go and find out... um, what you need to do to get unblocked, make the key decisions that will drive you forward and learn who they are as people so you can enjoy your time together. And that's what a meeting is, mm-hmm. right? And, mm-hmm. and you walk into that thinking, oh my gosh, this is a terrible waste of time. Basically, you've taken this one opportunity where you get to um, connect as people and drive that work forward meaningfully. And you've walked into it with an attitude of... Um, uh, repulsion and resistance, and you've blown it. You have you have completely lost your ability to take that moment and turn it into what you need to make it to make it go. So the first thing that has to happen for people to become successful with their meetings is you just gotta you just gotta knock that out. You gotta get that mindset shift um, shifted up uh, quickly. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to get rid of the word itself. Oh, all right. So let's let's get into that a bit. So you're right. The term meetings. Some people are like, yeah, they they there's there's this um there's this reaction. So what's the word? Do you have a series of words that that would work, or is there? How do you make that? How do you make that shift? Because it sounds like it's a, it's it's a it's it's not maybe it's a bit of a cultural shift, but it sounds like it's something that that can result in a cultural shift when it comes to meetings in general. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at meetings in general, they, you know, we talk about like, oh, how do we change culture and, and where's culture come from and whatnot. But, but really what culture is, is how we, it's the way that work gets done on our teams, right? It's mm-hmm. how we talk to each other. It's what we're doing, how we treat each other. And so the meeting uh, is the place where that gets enacted and we get to see what's real. So, the key to starting to shift your perspective on that moment and that opportunity is to uh, get rid of the word meeting because um, so my company lucid meetings, we've, we've done a lot of research into how uh, really high performing and elite teams uh, are successful at what they do. And what we found is that they all had 
very well-defined ways of coming together and talking about their work and getting it done. They know how to make decisions. They know how to have, they know how to party. They know how to, they know how to get together when they've had something go wrong and learn from it quickly, right? They know how to run all of these different kinds of conversations and they don't call them meetings. They absolutely are meetings, but that's not what they talk about. They talk about, we're going to do our action review. We're going to do our huddle. We're going to do our lightning round. We're going to do interviews, right? I've got um, a demo with a client. Every single one of those things is a meeting, but we don't go into it going, oh, here comes another meeting. We're mm. like, <laughs> you know, hey, <laughs> hey, this is my podcast interview, right? Yep. Like, this is worth your time. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a really good way to put it because there are, again, there are those kind of terms that throw people off. Oh. Did I lose you there? No, I can I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just heard something in the background that oh, came up. No, I'm here. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, all right. Let's jump back in. So uh, let's talk about you've got 16 different types of meetings. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, I Which, it's the the name is my whole work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, uh, the, the fact I'm glad we prefaced it why that you don't call the meetings because as soon as someone would hear 16 types, but let's go into, I want to talk about the, the discovery of these, these types. Like you must have sat down and said, okay, let's look at these and let's look at, you know, meetings in general and figure out how to break these down so that, that they can be more effective. Right. Because I think what happens is we try to punch all of these, several of these, maybe even all into one meeting and it, it, you just lose focus and, and traction. So can we talk a little bit about the, the, the 16 types and maybe the, how, how these came to you and how these kind of, um, made their way into, into the book? Because I think that that's, I think there's a, there's a good origin story there. Yeah. So the, um, the 16 types of meetings, uh, are, our work, we were um, working with our clients. So our mission at, at my company is to help teams run successful meetings every day. Um, and as I mentioned, it's because we found that when you are working in, you know, elite performance levels, um, one of the things that those teams absolutely know is how to prepare, how to come together, how to get results on a regular basis. And and so we were working with teams that were not yet at these elite performance levels, right? And they were looking at trying to run better meetings and they kept looking for things like, well, maybe we need an agenda or maybe we need to start on time or do, you know, all of these really basic kind of hygiene kind of things. Mm-hmm. And while those were interesting, they didn't, um, they didn't change their mindsets. It didn't change their culture. It didn't change, you know, their relationship to meetings. It just made them a little bit more productive, Which is lovely, but you know, we don't Mm -hmm. all go home and curl up around the fire saying, honey, I was productive today. You know, it's not. I do. I do. But I mean. (laughs) Yeah. Productive is good. Absolutely. Right. Productive is massively important to what we do. Um, And if you can also be meaningful. Yeah. And engaged. Yeah. I think that's the key, right? Is, is, is when people set foot into meetings of any sort, if there's no. Uh, if they don't feel there's any purpose behind them. And I think when you when you look at these 16 types of meetings that work, they're, it's implicitly stated in many of them, like what what the theme, the theme of them really. And I think that theming is such a powerful tool. Yes. And so that was, that was where these come from. So we were working with people and we found that, you know, the basics didn't work, but what did work was telling them, giving them guidance on how to run a specific kind of conversation that solves a specific kind of problem. Because that's what you're doing there, right? You're coming together to take a group of people who um, all had their own ideas about what was going on before they walked into the room. And when they walk out, they're all in alignment. They're all agreed. They're moving forward together. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. 
Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. But you're not always doing the same kind of thing. Sometimes you're solving a problem. Sometimes you're making a decision and whatnot. So as we started working on these guides and these, um, these you know, tools we were giving to our clients to help them run those meetings, we're like, well, how many of these do we have to make before, <laughs> before we're done? Because <laughs> when you start looking at it, you're like, oh my gosh, there's hundreds of thousands of different kinds of meetings. And I'm like, that, that can't be, that can't be, right. that can't be right. Um, so what are the commonalities? What are the patterns? And we found these 16 types, as you mentioned. And then I've had people come to me and they say, well, you know, that 16, that's way too many. So um, we're only going to learn two. Can we just learn two and then we'll we'll worry about the rest at some other time? But I think it's important to understand is that the these 16 types that we've um, discovered and, and outlined here are not, uh, you know, a pick and choose sort of menu of things you might want to do one day. Uh, the way to think about them really is very much like they are uh, the anatomy of how communication moves around your organization and your team. So there are some meetings that we use that are very much like at the circulatory system, right? Right. They, they keep the information um, flowing. You know, they're about momentum and connection and just making sure the body's moving. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and there are some meetings that are very much about um, figuring things out. They're very much thinking, like, what are our new ideas? What are our problems? What have we learned? What have we decided? It's very cognitive. And then there are a whole bunch of other meetings we run that are very much about trying to make sense of the world around us. They're very, you know, um, hey, uh, is that a friend or a foe out there? And yeah, <laughs> what can I can I understand what's happening in my environment? So it's it's really a, a way of understanding communication flow and the different ways in which communication has to flow throughout your organization as a you know sort of a, a complex organism made of people and systems. Um, and once you get that, boy, you can do some really great stuff with it. Now, you, you brought up something interesting, which I think people are listening right now saying, okay, so there's 16, but you some people only want to do two, uh, or three or four. Um, when you go through these, and as you work with organizations, because I know you do this, um, how, how does someone kind of adopt these in a way, especially if they've had a meeting culture that might be again, harsh word, toxic or, or not ideal, even, even to that degree. And they need to make some changes and they start to go through some of these types. Like do, is it, I mean, from, from my experience, when people are learning how to, you know, manage their time better is I'm, I'm a, I don't give them everything all at once because it's like a fire hose. Right. And they're like, okay, well, whoa, 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 I just need these things. And so uh, is that kind of how, I mean, the book gives you a lot in here. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic, <laughs> it's a fantastic resource. Like, and I'm going to obviously link to it in the show notes and, and I've, I've not read a book and there's, there's some books out there about meetings, but, but this book is, it, what I love is it's both um, tactical but yet there's also some practical elements to it. So uh, can you dig into that, the practical element of it? Because I think some people are going to, when, when at, at face value, they're going to say, okay, there's 16 types, which two, how do I like, and I think that's where people can kind of get stuck. Yeah. So I think that's, um, that's not how we start things with clients, of course, because you're exactly right, right? Like you can't, uh, you can't learn the, the entirety of the game until you, until you understand how to hit the ball. Right. Um, so, uh, one of the programs we run, and I think talking about this program it, uh, gives people an idea of how they might do something similar in their or own organization or with their own team, um, is called our, our Quick Start Program. And uh, it builds off some other research we did that looked at, you know, so, okay, I talked about these elite teams that run these really well-designed, powerful meetings. Um, and they're at this extreme end of performance because, you know, they got their stuff together uh, and they're rocking it. And at the other end, um, you have all of the companies where there's no training of any kind, 
Um, in fact, fewer than 20% of the people leading meetings in the U.S. today have any training of any kind, even though they spend maybe 80% of their work week in meetings. Mm -hmm. C craziness. Mm -hmm. so, there's, so there's no training of every ki any kind, and then every leader is left to decide how to meet on their own. Right? They're right. like, okay, run meetings, that's your job, whatever, figure it out. Uh, we're not going to train you. So that's um, the most common situation, and, and shockers doesn't work great. <laughs> so so like, oh, a bunch of people, their primary job, nobody trained them to do it. Um, so when you start there, the next level from that baseline level is to just set some basic expectations as an organization. And these are things like, every time we put a meeting on the calendar in this company or in this team, we're going to include in the calendar why we're meeting and what we expect to get out of it at the end. Gotcha. Like, right? Like you start there. Right. And at that point, at that, with just that one rule, you go, okay, why am I meeting? Well, why might I meet? What are the th things meetings can do? What can I get out of a meeting? And then the 16 types is a reference list. It's like a cheat sheet. It's like, well, here are 16 possible things I could do. Which one might it be? Right. Then it's, it's not, you're not trying to learn them all. You're using them as um, tools to help you answer that question. We're going to take a break for a moment. When we come back, I'm going to ask Dr. Keith about what happens when you start to apply the 16 types of meetings. Like, how do you actually make them work? But before we get into that, I want to talk about the idea of finding work or finding people to work for you. The perfect hire can have an impact on your business for years to come. So when you need to find that next person to help grow your business, LinkedIn Jobs will match the right talent with your open role fast. Now, LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates with the hard and soft skills that you're looking for if you're hiring, so you can hire the right person fast. Things like collaboration, creativity, adaptability, LinkedIn looks beyond the work skills and puts your job post in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly. And that's how LinkedIn makes sure your job post is seen by the people that you want to hire, people with the skills, qualifications, and other interests that will help your business grow. It's really no wonder that a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn. And that's why companies rated LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. Again, the platform is exploding. You want to be on there right now and you want to find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash timecrafting. Again, that's linkedin.com slash timecrafting to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. So again, linkedin.com slash timecrafting and get the first $50 off of your first job posting today. If you're like me, you get a lot of emails every single day, and it can be a soul-crushing distraction. And if that's the case, then you need SaneBox. SaneBox's artificial intelligence monitors your inbox. Automatically, the email that you don't really want to deal with, well, it gets moved to your Sane Later folder, you know, the newsletters and things like that. All that's really left is the important stuff, and that's the stuff that matters. If you know how email folders work, then you know how SaneBox works. You find an email in the wrong folder, you just move it. There's nothing to learn, there's nothing to install. SaneBox works directly with every single email server or service that's ever been created. Setting SaneBox up is easy. In fact, it works on top of your existing setup. So you don't need to change apps or any of your email habits by creating a new email account or anything like that. SaneBox just makes your existing one awesome. And that initial SaneBox purge can be really powerful for people. And then SaneBox just allows you to manage the daily emails from there. Now, I'm going to send you to a link where you can see the Inbox Zero Hero. So you check the show notes, you'll see that out as well. And there's lots of other cool features that SaneBox offers. Same black hole, same reminders, you can snooze emails, all of that fun stuff. I want you to take advantage of what SaneBox has to offer. So visit SaneBox.com slash timecrafting to start your free trial and get a $25 credit. So that's SaneBox, S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash timecrafting to get that free trial and a $25 credit. If you want to restore sanity to your email inbox, then you're going to want to take advantage of what SaneBox has to offer today. Did you know that continuing education is a great way to stay abreast of developments and best practices in your field? Then you're going to want to check out the UCI Division of Continuing Education. 
Online courses through the UCI Division of Continuing Education are taught by expert instructors with industry experience, and they offer flexibility and a real immersive online classroom experience that you can even collaborate with your peers online. They allow busy working adults to take classes at their own time, and you don't have to drive to a campus or be around a bunch of people. Now, there are certificate programs and specialized studies programs available. Certificate programs offer an in-depth body of knowledge to ensure you gain mastery of a particular topic, and specialized studies feature feature shorter, more concentrated curricula for those short on time. Both are distinctive achievements that can help prepare you for career advancement or transition. In fact, you can advance your career in as little as six months. Now, spring registration is now open, so I want you to visit ce.uci.edu slash productivityist and then enter the promo code TIMECRAFTING for 15% off of one course. Now, this discount is for almost all of the certificate programs. The exceptions include coding boot camps, international programs, teacher credentialing programs, and test prep courses. But if you go to ce.uci.edu slash productivityist and enter the promo code TIMECRAFTING, you'll get 15% off of any of the courses that fall outside of those exceptions. Now, this offer is only valid until July 31st, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. So I want you to take advantage of what the UCI Division of Continuing Education has to offer today. When I work with clients, I tell them that if you're gonna do something more than once, then you wanna try to automate it as much as possible. And I have to say, Zapier is the easiest way to automate your work. It connects all your business software and handles work for you so that you can focus on the things that matter most. I mean, growing a business is hard, especially when you're wasting hours every day moving data from emails to spreadsheets to your CRM to wherever else you need to move it to. Shouldn't that kind of stuff just happen without you really lifting a finger? Zapier can help. No more wasting time on tasks that you know could be automated because that's exactly what Zapier was built to do. Zapier lets you instantly engage with leads so you can send them to a CRM or spreadsheet and then notify your team so they can act fast on every opportunity. And that's important when you've got a growing client base. And that's just scratching the surface. Zapier supports more than 1,500 business applications, so the possibilities are virtually endless. And this is really gonna help when you're working with remote teams, whether you're a remote worker that's got a bunch of virtual assistants all over the place, or you're a larger business that's starting to apply remote work principles in your workplace. And best of all, it's easy to build the exact solution you need in minutes. You don't need to write code or ask a developer for help. Zapier does it for you in a simple and effective way. Join more than 4.5 million people who are saving an average of 40 hours per month by using Zapier. Right now, through the end of the month, try Zapier for free just by going to zapier.com slash timecrafting and then you can get that 14-day free trial. That's Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash timecrafting for your free 14-day trial. Give Zapier a try today. All right, so let's dig into um, a specific methodology that I've looked at before, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes because I've talked about this before, is the idea of holacracy, which is, um, and I don't know, you, 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 you must have come across holacracy, I'm, I'm sure, during your work because it involves status meetings like there's a lot of meetings that take place when have you, have you first off have you spent any time looking at holacracy and helping people that are trying to adopt that kind of uh non-hierarchical uh management style within a culture is that something that you've looked at before or or, or uh is it something that you know i that it it, it I think can happen automatically to a degree when you are starting to implement some of these practices that you're talking about. So there's an interesting overlap, right? Yeah, between yeah. Um, between get it, running great meetings and looking at what that means and then starting to slide into things like holacracy and teal and, you know, some of the X scale um, sound cloud ways of doing tribes and, you know, all mm -hmm. of those kinds of different uh, organizational systems. Right. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I haven't worked with organizations that are doing holacracy specifically, but I completely get where you're going with this. Okay. Okay. Um, let's, let's, I want to talk about the different, I want to talk about the five areas, you know, the focus areas when it comes to like meeting performance maturity, because I think when people are. And we're kind of jumping around in the book a little bit if you read the book, but that's okay <laughs> it's, because I think that it's so many teasers. <laughs> well, but yeah, well, and I think, but I think the other thing is when you're, this is not a book that I think you can sit down and read from cover to cover, you know, and it's, it's a, there's reference stuff in here. Like you, I think as, as, cause you're, you want to get, um, 
acclimatized and co- comfortable with a new way of thinking about this kind of thing because there is that uh, for a lot of people there is that preconceived notion about meetings so you know when you start to put these meetings together and you start to apply some of these 16 types then like how how do you make them work how do you make them so they do actually work and i think that this is where these five focus areas really can come into play so can you touch on those yeah you bet so um so right so we talked about how when you're starting with like nothing you you begin by putting in some basic expectations right Right. some basic guidelines and and that whole area is really about um establishing some standards so that people uh, can in fact have a way to get better that's correct for your organization. So that's about meeting design. Mm-hmm. Um, and that whole skill area of meeting design. Now, so if you've done podcasts, if you've done interviewing, if you've done sales, you're already doing this. And that's that's part of that switch is once you've got a little bit of headspace around it, you'll realize that you have a bunch of these skills and the ramp is not as big as you think it is. Right. right. It's it's more about more about having that that the ideas that you're already familiar with snap into place in a new way that all of a sudden unlocks all kinds of potential you weren't you weren't even realizing was there. So um, if you've ever prepped for a sales call or something like that, you've done meeting design work. You've decided how you're going to introduce the call. You've decided what you're going to show. You've decided how you want to run the conversation so you get that result at the end. That's meeting design. The next kind of focus area is skills. And meeting skills are um, are the kinds of things that most people get any training on if they've ever had training. It's you know how to watch the time and how to take a note and how to ask a great question so that everybody will reply. And that's an area where... Um, you, the, you can get the basics and you can do a pretty darn good job really fast. Um, and then you can run with it forever and become master facilitators and, you know, all Mm -hmm. kinds of cool stuff. Right. Right. So, um, so there's, those are the two like core areas to get started with. Mm -hmm. Um, after that, then you can start looking at things like, uh, facilities and technology. So, you know, do you have in place the kinds of things that allow people to be successful? You know, if that is the the area where you're going to make the sale or where your team is going to decide what to build and what and how to build it and drive their productivity up, you know, do they have what they need to do that well? Um, stakeholder satisfaction, which is about making sure that when you're meeting, you're getting um, both uh, a good business result out of it, and also a good um, human result out of it, which, by the way, is a business result, <laughs> right? Yep, yep. So that's it's just, we don't we don't talk about it in that same way, and the same way we do about dollars and whatnot. But um, a lot of the research we have on meetings makes it incredibly clear that the quality of the meetings run in your organization has an immense impact on overall team performance, as we've mentioned, but also um, employee retention. So uh, if you're running lousy meetings, you've probably got a, a turnover problem if your industry is at all competitive. So, you know, huge money there. Right, right, right. All <laughs> right, as, as we get close to wrapping up here, because I, I want to, uh, again, I think conciseness in meetings can be helpful too. <laughs> but <laughs> I want that, to... So but, that's the last, the, last, uh, the last area, which is right. cultural ownership. And yes. for you, yeah. uh, one of your key values is brevity yes yeah Yeah. well there you go but but i think one of the things that i want to touch on before we wrap up is again you're looking at the title of the book and someone is gonna pick up this book and they say the meetings that make or break your organization but as i went through the book this is this can be applied in organizations big and small they can be applied to you know people who are running solo businesses, solo operations, what, what are some of the, what's the key takeaway? Like for me, that was a big takeaway. I looked at this book and I'm like, okay, this is going to be good for organizations. And I went through it. I'm like, Oh wait, no. Um, I'm learning these things so that as my business does scale, cause I do work with people that's like remote workers and things like that from time to time. So it's helping me with that. It actually can help for example, in, in podcast interview situations as well. Like there's lots of these things that I didn't think it would be able to help me with uh, because I'm not a big organization. So for me, that was my takeaway. Uh, what is one, what, what's to, you know, and, and the, again, there is a lot here and 
I highly recommend if you are uh, running an organization or you have meetings and you want to make your meetings better that, you know, you want to pick up this book, but what's one of the key takeaways, if not the, like that you want to make sure that people get out of this book. So here's, here's the key thing that, um, that I think is important with this book. So all of the other business books you're going to read about, um, productivity or vulnerability or, innovation or diversity and inclusion, all of these key big themes we have that we're trying to drive into our businesses, meetings are the practical way that you do that. Mm -hmm. yep. That's the takeaway. Yep. Here's how you use these as tools to drive all of those other things because the rest of that stuff is beautiful, wonderful, great big idea stuff. But if it doesn't show up in what you are talking about with you, uh, people you work with day in, day out, it doesn't exist. It, that change doesn't happen. This is your mechanism. So one more thing. What's one thing that someone who's running an organization or who you know, wants to make their meetings better and more actionable and, and, and you know, have basically like you know, more productive meetings, what's one thing that they can do today after listening to this that they can t put into practice right away that's going to give them some results right away other than picking up your book? other than picking up my book. Um, you know what? The, the first thing they can do is they can stop and they can ask the rest of their team what they think. Yeah, get some, get some good feedback there and figure out. Not, like, not only get the good feedback, but then make it clear that doing great at meetings is something that you care about. Right. You know, yeah. you know put it out there. Yeah. Get started. Elise, this has been great. Um, I'm really, you know, what, what I love about getting books like this is that there is a repeat value to it, like to go back and revisit it because I think, you know, you, you talk about meeting mastery and stuff in here and, and it's not a one and done proposition and it's not something much like, you know, it's productivity. I say is like a lifestyle. It's not like a diet. It's not like you can go once and go, okay, I'm good. I've got it. Like, mm -hmm. and what I love about this book is that there is that element of, you know, I need to brush up and this book will help you do that. So it's where the action is, the meetings that make or break your organization. Elise, thanks for joining me today on the productivity podcast. Where else can people keep up with your work? You can find us at lucidmeetings.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Thank you.